Hi guys, and welcome to day one of virtual marine biology. So um, I'm going to try to do this as best as I can this way. If we need to tweak stuff, we will. Some of the lectures I've kind of shortened a little bit just because we're not going to get enough time to really show you the videos I want and um, really, really get into the details. So I kind of I made it a little simpler for you guys. Um, I am going to have a couple of supplemental videos that I do want you guys to watch as homework. Um, there's not assignment due, but I do want you guys to watch them. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be in the Canvas site. Um, but until then, let's get started on um, some of these other chordates that we've been talking about. So we're done with the fishes. We're done with the cartilaginous fishes and the bony fishes and the ignathans. Now we're going to be getting into the reptiles and the birds today. Um, the bird section is kind of short because there is going to be a bird assignment for you guys to do. Uh, but we're going to be focusing on reptiles today. So let's get started. So, first of all, we are in the class Reptilia. So remember that we are in the phylum Chordata, the subphylum Vertebrata, and now we are in the class Reptilia. So that's where we're at right here, and you can see a classic example of a reptile right here. Now, we are going to be talking about four different types of reptiles. We're going to be talking about the sea snakes, the sea turtles, the saltwater crocodiles, not alligators, because those are freshwater, and we're going to be talking about the marine iguanas as well. So starting off with the sea turtles, um, unfortunately, sea turtles are great and everyone loves the sea turtles, but every single species of sea turtles on our planet right now is either threatened or endangered. Now there is a difference between threatened and endangered. So endangered means that they are literally in danger of going extinct. They are almost there. The populations are very, very small, which means we don't have a lot of genetic diversity, which means if something happens, potentially the entire population could get wiped out, which is not something that we want. Now, threatened is a little less serious. Threatened means they are threatened with becoming endangered. Okay, so they're not quite endangered yet, but they are threatened. They're on their way to becoming endangered, which is on their way to becoming extinct. Which again, so for these sea turtles, unfortunately, is really, really bad. This is due to things like fishing. People still eat turtle. Um, they love to take the shells for different things, carve artwork out of them, uh, make them into fancy looking things. Um, and again, just poaching in general. Another one is bycatch. So bycatch means it's not the catch you were intended for. So you were trying to hunt for fish and you've got a bunch of turtles in your net. You don't need the turtles, but they're already dead. So a lot of the times that these, these, um, these turtles are taking it from just every aspect and every angle, kind of like the sharks we talked about. They're really just, just not good, not good stuff. Um, most of these guys are going to be absolutely protected because they are either threatened or endangered. We have learned to protect them. Most countries around the world now say you cannot hunt turtles, you cannot fish for turtles, you cannot eat turtles. But of course, not every single country is on board with that, and so a lot of that still ends up happening. So unfortunately for these poor little turtles, it's kind of serious for them. Now getting into the physical uh, attributes of the turtle, so we have this upper shell part right here. This is known as the carapace, right? The carapace, just like in the crab, remember when we talked about the carapace, right, that back kind of part? Same kind of thing with the turtle right here. The entire upper shell is known as the carapace. Each one of these plates is known as a scoot, right? Scoots. Um, this little arrow, arrow area right here, right above the neck, is known as the um, nuchal, right? And the, basically the lower part right underneath here, so the top part is the carapace, anywhere from here and above. Anywhere from here and below is known as the plastron. So on the dorsal side, you have the carapace, on the ventral side, you have the plasteron. Okay, so make sure to know those differences, and at least the differences between this carapace, the scoots, and the plasteron for something like a test, because those are easy test questions. Now, people sometimes wonder if the turtle can actually come out of its shell. We've seen a lot of those in, in cartoons and stuff, where the turtle will crawl out of its shell and leave the shell. That is actually completely false, because these turtles are all have their ribs fused to their carapace, to their, their shell. So if they were to move, right, if they were to try to crawl out of it, they actually can't. So if you were trying to remove one from their shell, they would in fact die, which is not a good thing. Okay, so once again, you cannot remove the turtle from their shells. The ribs are fused to the shell itself. So essentially, the turtle is a little package. You cannot separate the package from the shell. It would basically just kill the turtle. So no, unlike those cartoons, you can't have the turtle getting out and running away off, out of his shell. Uh, because he is basically built into that shell. He is permanently attached. Now, they do have these big kind of what looks like biting jaws or these big beak-like mouths. Now, they do have very, very powerful jaws, but they don't actually have any teeth. 
And that's because they're not really shredding anything. They're mostly crushing things or catching small little prey like that. And a lot of them are just eating algae, so they don't even need teeth for anything. They just need that powerful jaw for the ripping. Now, uh, sea turtle reproduction is an interesting one. So you guys are probably familiar with the fact that turtles lay their eggs on land. Right? That's one of the few marine animals that actually comes up on land to lay their eggs, and that's because it's protected from the marine environment. There's lots of predators in the ocean. There's not a ton of marine predators right on the shore. Um, so the female will crawl up onto the land. She will lay her eggs in a little nest. The male will fertilize them, and then they will both take off back out to sea and hope for the best. Now, most of the time, these turtles are protected because they have a very, very hard, very leathery shell. It's very different from bird shells. Even though they are shells, and they do lay eggs. Um, sorry, excuse me, they do lay eggs. The, the outside of the bird egg is usually pretty fragile, but the outside of a turtle egg is leathery, and it's really resilient, and that's because they're buried in the sand for a while, and they don't want anything stepping on top of it, breaking it, uh, potentially predators getting into it, so you want a nice hard shell. So eventually that leathery material is actually gonna start to dry up and become brittle, and that's how the turtles can actually come out of them. Now, when they do come out of them, um, you guys have probably seen these little videos, the little turtles are basically running towards shore. It's very cute, very adorable, but this is also very important because they're hatched on land in the safety of the sand, but then they have to get all the way to the ocean before they can swim away and protect themselves. So in that interim, there is a lot of predation that can happen, mostly in the form of birds. So birds are kind of waiting there and they're just kind of like waiting and watching and then they're going to swoop down on those poor little innocent turtles as they're kind of hurrying and scurrying to get into the ocean. So that is a lot of times where the predators will um, take the babies, unfortunately. But it's kind of like a safety in numbers. So some of the clutches can be very large so that there's a lot of babies all rushing to the shore, right, or all rushing to the ocean at the same time. So that kind of, you know, safety in numbers, maybe not all of you make it, but some of you still do. So that's kind of the parental care that they're given. Um, funny enough, with these guys, uh, their temperature actually determines the sex of the turtle. So at higher temperatures, you'll get more females. At lower temperatures, you'll get more males. And the threshold usually depends on the species, but it is a pivotal threshold that will change depending if you're above it or below it. Well, as global warming happens and climate change actually happens, we're starting to see a lot higher temperatures, which means we're starting to see a lot more females. Now, females can lay big clutches of eggs and one male can reproduce with all of those females, which is okay, but we're kind of decreasing the genetic diversity if we do that. Then everybody's related to the male, the one male, and all the females are gonna have essentially cousins. So, and again, you don't want cousins reproducing because then you get inbreeding and you get genetic mutations and that's all sorts of bad. So, this is kind of a problem because all of the, you know, turtles are now shifting towards the female side and even then, if it gets warm enough, we're gonna lose all males, which obviously you can imagine is a very, very bad thing. So, this pivotal temperature will determine the sex via either this male, if it's a lower temperature, or a female, if it's a higher temperature. Now let's talk about some of the different types of turtles that we have out there. The first is the green sea turtle. It's probably the easiest, one of the easiest to identify because of its really green skin. And it gets this green skin, this green pigment in its skin because it eats so much algae. So it's basically just eating sea grasses and algae all day, every day. And so it kind of appears this like green hue in color. Um, these guys are tropical sea turtles, so you can find them out in Hawaii, you can find them in the Keys. I've seen a bunch of these guys. They're really, really cute. Um, and they are just, again, these herbivores. An average size sea turtle is probably about this big. Um, and again, um, yeah, they're green because of all the algae and the seaweed that they're eating. Next up is the loggerhead. The loggerhead kind of looks like a green sea turtle, except it's got this little ridge right there on its um, carapace. That's a noticeable uh, indicator of this particular species, that loggerhead. Um, these guys are threatened, so uh, they are on their way to becoming extinct, which is not a great thing, um, but they are the least vulnerable. So all of the other turtles are more, I'd say critically endangered or on their way to becoming critically endangered than the loggerhead. The loggerhead is actually fairly common as a turtle. Another tropical species that you can see either in Hawaii, Florida, and on any of those tropical waters. 
Um, and these guys are feeding on mostly invertebrates like crabs and other uh, mollusks. So their jaws are not really used for the grabbing and the biting of the algae, but it's more the crushing of the shells of some of these invertebrates. Uh, next up is the leatherback. The leatherback is the largest of all the turtles. It is absolutely massive. This is a full grown man who's about six feet tall. And you can see how big this turtle is compared. I mean, his, his head alone is about the size of this guy's torso. So these guys are massive. They can be several tons and they can be up to, I believe, eight feet long. They're huge, huge turtles. Another indicator of the leatherback turtle is because their, their scoops, those plates of the plastron are covered, sorry, of the carapace. Plastron's in the middle, carapace is in the back. Uh, the scoots are actually covered in this like leathery skin. So what you see here is you see these long ridges going down their back. You don't actually see any of the scoots. That is the most noticeable indicator of the leatherback turtle. Easy, easy to identify. By far the easiest turtle to identify. One, he's the largest. And two, it does not have those scoots. It has these leathery skin going all along the outside of his shell, of his uh, carapace right there. And these guys are, are amazing turtles. They can dive very, very deep because they are so large, right? They need to feed quite a bit. Usually feeding on jellyfish, this is where you get that whole don't throw your plastic bags in the ocean because things like this are eating them. It's really actually totally tragic because a lot of the sea turtles, not only are they being um, captured and eaten and uh, poached for their shells and stuff like that, but they're also just eating plastic and they're just dying on their own in the ocean because of all this excess plastic. You really can't tell the difference between a plastic bag and a jellyfish when you're in the ocean. And these are turtles, you know, they don't know that what plastic is, they're just looking for food. And unfortunately, these guys don't have hands, so if you start eating something, you can't exactly just be like, gross, you're kind of going to keep eating it, which is things like whales and turtles and these larger animals are going to be accumulating these plastics. And that's, it's just absolutely tragic. So. These guys are, uh, again, over a thousand pounds, anywhere between six and eight feet. I've heard both. We're going to go with about six feet here. Uh, and they do have these leathery shells that goes all along the back here, and they're feeding on jellies. Okay, so the hawksbill, right, kind of a mix between a green sea turtle and a loggerhead sea turtle, does not have the little arch in the, um, in the shell on the background, also does not have the green skin. Remember that? that a uh, green sea turtle eats a lot of that um, green algae and the green sea grasses, which gets stored in his fat. So all that pigment gets stored in his fat, unlike the um, hawksbill here. Uh -oh. More technical difficulties. You guys are used to this though, right? Okay, here we go. All right, so next up are sea snakes. So we're getting away from the turtles, moving on to the sea snakes. Um, sea snakes are not really big. They're not like the anacondas that you think of. They're not super, super long. They're very small, actually, usually only three to four feet. They're only found in the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. They are very venomous, though. So even though they spend most of their time on land, they do swim around a little bit to feed, to breed, stuff like that. Um, but they do have this rounded tail right here, kind of hard to see in this picture, but you can always Google images of this. They always have that flattened tail. That's, that's for the swimming. So it's essentially like the column fin of a fish used for the swimming and the propulsion through the water. Uh, they do breed at sea. Like I said, they spend most of the time on land, but they do breed at sea. Very different than the sea turtles who breed on land and spend most of their time at sea. These guys are ovoviviparous. Remember, that means laying live, laying eggs inside, but then as they come out of you, they're hatched live, so it's the eggs and the live birth as a combination. I already mentioned that they are quite venomous, not poisonous, venomous. So if they were to bite you, it can be fatal. People have died from sea snake attacks. Luckily, we don't really have them here. They are tropical species. Uh, that's because, again, they're poikiotherms. They cannot regulate their internal body temperature. So they must do so externally. And so that's why they live in those warmer conditions, those warmer climates, to keep their body temperatures up so that they don't freeze. Um, even though they are very, very venomous, they're really not a harm to us. It's kind of a defensive mechanism to us if they were to bite us, right? They're not trying to feed on us. They don't want to eat us. Uh, what they're doing is they're protecting themselves. So it's a defensive mechanism that they have to basically, you know, to protect themselves. Um, so mostly they're feeding on little fishes. So they'll swim down and catch little fishes. They're small. Their mouths are small too. They're eating little tiny fishes. So not something that we particularly have to worry about. Saltwater crocodiles. So these are not alligators. These are saltwater crocodiles. 
They're mostly found in the Indian Ocean, some in the Western Pacific. Um, these guys are big, so not like the alligators that we have in Florida that are actually pretty small. These guys are big, big, in fact, sometimes reaching up to 30 feet long. Most of them are less than 20, but sometimes 30 feet long. That's three stories of, of crocodile. That's insane, right? These guys also are not like the American crocodile that we have. They're not very shy. They're not very timid. They are bold, especially the ones in India. They literally will just crawl out, grab somebody, and drag them into the water. Um, they have been known to eat people, to, to eat anything that they want. We're talking bison, we're talking antelope, we're talking anything that they can put their little mouths, big mouths around. Um, they will actually eat, including people. So we are not on the foot, top of the food chain when it comes to these alligators. I mean, essentially, sorry, the crocodile. Essentially, that 30-foot crocodile is basically like a dinosaur. It's a huge dinosaur trying to eat us, and they're actually pretty good at it. In fact, they have very, very, very strong jaws. These strong jaws are used for holding things down. So they basically grab and they bite and they hold down. And that's because what they're gonna do is they're gonna drag something underwater, wait until it drowns, and then they kind of like stick them under like a log or a tree or something that has fallen underneath until the body becomes essentially like, like rancid and kind of soft and squishy. Then they'll go back a couple days later and actually start eating off of that. So they don't, eat, they don't eat you right away. You're too tough. They can't rip you apart. Their jaws aren't meant for that. They're meant for the snapping, the grabbing, and the pulling. Um, this is why you can actually see some people who can go up to an alligator or a crocodile and hold their mouth shut. It's because their jaws, their muscles are all meant for closing. They're not meant for opening. So they're actually pretty bad at the opening, but they're really good at the closing. So all you have to do is almost kind of like wrap a little piece of twine around, them. maybe not twine, but wrap something around their mouth and you'll keep them nice and shut, they won't be able to actually get you. And that's how people can wrestle alligators and crocodiles is because their jaws are all meant for the snapping shut and not for the opening up. Um, these guys also have what's called, remember, crocodile tears. We talked a little bit about this and sea turtles as well. Most of the reptiles can do this. In fact, some of the birds can do this as well. They have a salt gland, a very specialized salt gland that allows them to drink the seawater, filter out the fresh water that they need to, and then cry out the salt. That's why you guys have heard of maybe crocodile tears, right? Salty tears, right? That's where they're getting it from. They're filtering out the salts from the water and then they're actually getting that fresh water. They're maintaining that fresh water. Uh, marine iguanas typically are gonna be found in things like the Galapagos. Some are different species are gonna be found in Florida. Specifically, this guy is one of the divers. He basically uh, spends all of his time on land except when he goes to feed and he will actually jump in and swim around and feed underwater uh, and he basically is eating things like sea grasses, eel grasses, algae, stuff like that. So remember to be considered a marine organism you really only need 50% of your diet coming from the ocean. So if you have more than 50% of your diet, which this guy does, even though he spends all of his time on land, he is still considered a marine organism. Um, they do like any reptile, right? They are poikiotherms, they need to warm up so they spend most of their time laying around on on rocks, on the land, sunbathing, if you will. Uh, their counterparts that live in Florida are bright green, really cute, except total nuisances, because they don't eat algae, they eat people's gardens. My dad lives in the Florida Keys, and he can't, he's like that old guy going, get off my lawn, you kids, yelling at iguanas, because they're just eating his flowers, which he hates. Um, so it is pretty funny. So again, spending most of their time on land, diving down to get the food that they need to, to feed. Okay, so we're gonna be starting to talk about the class AVs. Remember, we are done with the class reptilia, now we're moving on to the class AVs. These are going to be your birds. This guy right here is a uh, pelican, I'm sure you guys recognize him. Right? He's got this big old pouch right here on his neck. This is known as a guler pouch. G-U-L-A-R pouch, right? It is a guler pouch, essentially what he does is he's gonna come down and he's gonna scoop up a bunch of water, presumably with a fish in it, well, actually, they have a, a pretty good eyesight, so what he'll do is he'll spot a fish, then go down, scoop the water so the fish doesn't have time to react, then he will release the water out as he keeps the fish inside his little guler pouch. So this is how these guys are active uh, hunters. This guy right here is someone we were going to see very common out in the uh, field trip that we're going to do, but we're going to see him now digitally. This is a cormorant. Both of these guys are diving birds. And so what they will do is they will basically fly above, spot a fish, dive down, and then they will attack their fish. This guy will basically swallow the water around the fish. This guy will actually chase the fish down. 
When people ask me what's the weirdest thing I've ever seen while, snor while scuba diving, I'll tell them a cormorant. I'm 40 feet down and here comes this bird swimming right by me. He's down there hunting for fish because they're excellent diving birds. The reason you can, well, one of the ways you can tell that they're diving birds is if you look at their, um, their feet, they're webbed. So again, structure leads to function. If you have webbed feet, you're gonna be able to move through the water and therefore this is kind of an evolutionary adaptation that they've gotten um, that allows them to swim really well. So that's why they can go and actually dive down and hunt for their prey. They don't have to walk around like some of the other birds or even the, you know, say like the eagles and the uh, hawks that have those talons for the grabbing, right? These guys are pretty much webbed for just the swimming. Now, when we talk about birds, we have to mention that unlike their cousins, the reptiles, and they are cousins because they are both reptiles and birds descended from dinosaurs, which is pretty cool. Unlike their cold-blooded reptile relatives who are poikiotherms, birds are actually homeotherms. They can maintain an internal body uh, temperature, just like we can. Uh, what they also have is feathers. That should not shock you guys that all birds have wings and all birds have feathers. These feathers usually, especially for marine birds, are used for uh, insulation. So they have really, really thick, dense plumage and that allows them to kind of stack those feathers one on top of each other. So when they are, say, swimming in the water and it is cold, cold water, they actually don't get wet, right? Their, their uh, feathers are also covered with this little oil. It's like a waxy little substance that coats each one of those feathers and that protects the water from getting in. So the water rolls right off their little feathers and they stay nice and warm. So essentially, even the penguins and the cormorants and the um, uh, <laughs> the seagull, I said seagulls, pelicans, who are diving around and they're swimming around, even if it's very, very cold water, the water doesn't actually touch their skin. It's protected by that layer of feathers with those really, really thick oils on them. Oils and water don't mix. That water runs right off of them. They stay nice and dry and nice and warm really good uh, adaptation that these birds have. Now, we did talk about the leathery shells in turtles that are used for protection. Birds have a slightly different type of eggs um, for their shells. So they have these very, very hard shelled eggs. So the leather, again, eventually in a turtles will kind of start to soften a little bit, become a little bit more brittle, allow those turtles to crawl out. Sort of the same kind of thing happens here. Their shells are much harder, and so the, the chick has to be a little bit larger to be able to peck through. But again, being exposed to the temperatures and the environment, those shells will weaken just a little bit over time to allow those birds to come out. Now, a lot of these birds, if you've ever been to, say, a coastal area, you probably see huge groups of birds, right? Usually they're all kind of sitting on the same rock, nesting on the same rock. That's because these guys are colonial nesters. They like to nest together. It's almost like the fishes with the safety in numbers. Essentially, you have a bunch of different eyes looking out for your babies. So if a predator were to come by, you spot it, you squawk, then everybody starts squawking. That predator goes, well, I've been seen. There's no way I can get anyone now or can sneak up on anybody. So essentially, it's a bunch of parents keeping their kids all like, uh, protected. Uh, a lot of times, they're going to do this on things like cliff sides and aren't really accessible to, say, us or other predators, but for a bird, Easy to fly in, easy to fly out. They don't have to worry about, say, falling off the cliff because they could just fly away. Now, if you are a cliff nester, for an example, you don't want a big round shell. And that's something we were going to see in lab, but you guys can always Google this at home. Look up cliff nesters or species that are nesting on cliffs, and you'll see not big round eggs because those eggs could potentially boop, 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 right off the edge, right? You're going to see more oval or almost kind of like um, uneven shaped eggs and that's so if, if it rolls over it can actually get stuck on something and won't roll off the cliff and potentially die. So it's kind of a, um, it's another one of those evolutionary traits that we see in these cliff uh, nesting birds to help prevent their offspring from rolling off the edge when they're still in those nests. Uh, they are known for protecting their young. Again, not only do birds nest, but they will actually raise their young. Penguins will do this. Um, other birds will do this. Remember the seagull with the vomit button, right? They have a little tiny red dot on their chin, and that's for when they're coming over and feeding the chicks. The chicks will peck at that little orange spot, and then the seagull bleh, will vomit the food to the little chicks. And so essentially, it's a little button to let the parent know when the kids are hungry. Um, a vomit button, because they are regurgitating their food for the young, which is interesting. So they do have a lot of parental care, which is very um, successful for these bird species. Uh, they also do complex behaviors like preening and mating. Oh, some of the social behaviors when they're mating are so 
interesting slash funny. I'm gonna have to show you guys a video of this, or at least I'm gonna post the um, the link to you online of really unique bird adaptations for their mating, and they do all these different squawks and they bounce around and they do. Oh, it's all it's hilarious. It's hilarious. Um, so we're gonna see some of that. But these are again social cues, especially when they're preening each other. That's not just to help them. You know, removing things like ticks and mites and parasites that might be on them, feeding the bird, of course, because birds eat bugs. Um, but it's also very social, you know, they're keeping, they're keeping a social group. They're keeping kind of like, I'll help you, you help me. Let's maintain civil, you know, civil, let's be civil to each other, which is very unique and interesting for bird species to do because a lot of animals don't do that. The mammals we know do that, but birds are now finally starting to get into this too. It's similar to kind of like the cleaning stations that we learned about in fishes. They know it's benefiting both of them, so it wouldn't do any, them any good to fight over it. It just would be do everybody some good to just kind of go with the flow and, and, and be civil. Now let's talk about some specific birds. We're gonna be talking about the penguins first off. We talked about the uh, pelicans, we talked about the cormorants. This is a penguin right here. You guys should recognize penguins. Now unlike those cartoons that maybe you saw when you were a kid with the polar bears playing with the penguins, polar bears are the northern hemisphere, penguins are only the southern hemisphere. So there are no penguins in the northern hemisphere, none. People were like, wait a minute, I've seen in the wild, and those are puffins. If you don't know the difference between puffins and penguins, look that up because you need to know the difference between the two. So make sure you guys go look up puffins and penguins. Puffins, northern hemisphere, and some southern hemisphere. Penguins, only southern hemisphere. So you will never see a polar bear and a penguin in the same place unless you're in a zoo. Um, what else? We know that penguins are those big, you know, big round, rotund looking birds. That's because they do have that nice layer of insulation. That is blubber. Just like the seals and sea lions we're going to learn about next week, right? These guys are keeping them warm. They're keeping them protected. Um, they also have that really oily feathers. Again, the water just rolls right off of them. So while they're swimming around looking for food, which is what they spend a lot of their time doing, they don't get cold. Antarctica is very cold. Also, these penguins, specifically the emperor penguins, uh, they do mate for life, like many birds do. They will mate for life. Um, and they will, both actual parents will take care of the offspring. So in Antarctica with the emperor penguins, the female will lay the eggs. She will protect it while the male is out feeding, right? It's a long, long walk to go feed because they're on the inside of Antarctica where it's protected from any potential predators like, you know, killer whales and stuff like that. And so they will have to walk all the way to the edge to go swimming and go feeding. And so the female will have to sit and wait and starve herself until the male returns. Then they will swap. He will take care of the young and she will go off and feed. So it's very much a mutualistic relationship with the parents taking care of these offspring, which only increases the survivability of the offspring, which is what you want. Um, yep. Okay, so I know this one was a little bit quick. We're gonna have some longer ones next week. This is the first trial run with a video recording, so you guys have the information if you need anything more. I will have a list of video uh, videos for you guys to watch. Um, of course, I will still have my dad jokes up there because I know this is what keeps you guys going at these troubling times. Um, but I also wanna say, you know, thank you guys so much for being such an awesome class. I'm really gonna miss you guys. Um, so virtual hug to all my wonderful students. Uh, I'm still going to be around. If you guys need anything, call me, text me, email me, um, whatever, contact me through Canvas, whatever you guys need to do. I am still around for you guys. Um, I'm still working out the rest of the semester and figuring stuff out, but stay safe, stay safe, stay home, um, take care of yourselves. And, you know, if you guys ever need to contact me in the future for whatever reason, just to say hi, I'm around for you guys always. And we'll get through this semester together. I'm really sorry that this is happening and we can't do all the fun things that I had planned for you guys for the rest of the semester, but we're gonna make it work, guys, and we're gonna get through this together. So stay safe, stay home, wash your hands, um, and you know, just, we're gonna get through this. It's gonna be it's gonna be rough for a while, but don't worry, we're, we're all gonna be okay. So I will see you guys um, on, well, for the next lecture for mammals. Take care.